Hello, and welcome to Planning for Anything, an overview of business continuity and disaster recovery. I am Amelia Hugh, the Senior Events Specialist at ESET North America. Please note that this live presentation is being recorded, and it will be available following the conclusion of the webcast. For more information on the product and features mentioned in this webcast, please check out the Attachments tab. If you have questions for the presenter during the webcast, you can submit them through the Bright Talk question tab at the top and we will address them during the Q&A session. Today we have invited special guest Mike Coombs, VP of Sales with StorageCraft to present. StorageCraft is the newest member of the ESET Technology Alliance and we are proud to announce that customers now have the option to add StorageCraft backup and disaster recovery to their layered security strategy. If you are heading to the RSA conference happening this week in San Francisco or to Interop next week in Las Vegas, please stop by the ESET booth for a live demo of StorageCraft solution. A little bit about our presenter today. Mike Coons has over 22 years of experience in product management, business development, and sales. At StorageCraft, Mike focuses on expanding, Mike's focus, sorry, is on expanding StorageCraft's global reach by establishing channel partnerships that focus on profitability for the channel partner. Mike has been instrumental in establishing the managed service provider program and several key strategy relationships. Mike is also responsible for working closely with international distributors to introduce StorageCraft's product line into new markets. And so with that, I'd like to start the presentation and hand it over to Mike. Mike, thanks for being here this morning. All right. Thanks, Amelia. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, it's exciting for me to be able to present to you and to share a little bit more about StorageCraft and, and the solutions that we're offering through ESET. And even more exciting that uh, we have this partnership with, the, with ESET and have become a technology alliance partner. So um, what I, some of my object, objectives for today are to give you an overview um, of who StorageCraft is, why you can count on us for your disaster recovery needs. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about the difference between backup and disaster recovery and why you um, could, why that could be a, or should be an important part of your business strategy. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the very specifically about the StorageCraft solutions and um, what they what they mean. I'm going to switch headsets. Hang on one second. I'm having trouble with this one. Can you hear? I hope this works better now. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mike. Is this better? Okay. Um, so a little bit about StorageCraft. Um, StorageCraft was founded in 2003. We've been around about 12 years. Um, initially, we were a, a low-level device driver company. We provided um, snapshot drivers for other companies who were making backup. Um, we decided early on that it made sense for us to start building our own backup uh, and disaster recovery solutions primarily because uh, we felt that there were, there were some glaring holes in the way that the, the products were being implemented in the market and we felt that we could solve those um, with, with the technology that we had. Um, we are a privately held company. Um, we've always been profitable, and the reason I believe that's important is because um, a, a profitable company is one that you can rely on to maintain consistent pricing, to um, to be there when you need them, um, and to to really provide the services that you're looking for long term. We're based in in Draper, Utah. We've recently op opened up offices in Ireland, Sydney, and Tokyo. Uh, we're becoming more and more of a global company. We do about 70 million in revenue. And growing very quickly, the chart to the right, that's our actual uh, growth, growth uh, trajectory that you can see there, um, and it continues uh, to grow very rapidly. And a lot of the industry publications um, that we rely on, you know, really to evaluate our type of solution have recognized us as, as a leader in the space, and we're very, we're very proud of that, that recognition. Um, a little bit more about StorageCraft. So when we define our brand, uh, the thing that we look at, we want to maintain our legendary reliability. Um, that's actually a, a term that was coined by one of our competitors and one that we are, we're very proud of. Um, when An example of this is two years ago, we were ready to release um, a Linux version of our products. And as we did the final testing for it, we came across some things that 
that we weren't happy with in terms of recovery. Um, a very, very small percentage of recoveries would have um, an issue that we felt put our customers at risk. And so we chose not to launch the product to re-architect it and have only, you know, just this month launched our full Linux um, solution. So even though it meant coming to market a little bit later with that solution, um, it allows us to maintain that reliability that we're known for. We believe that disaster recovery solution has to work every time and we're not willing to, to compromise on that. Um, that leads us to the product and the mission of the product is to work as promised every time. Um, and then the company, we're dedicated to sound business principles. We believe that everyone should be making money on the solutions, um, including you know, our channel partners, um, the end user customers, the corporations who rely on us for backup and disaster recovery, should be able to see that using our solutions saves them money um, you know, far more than what the solutions cost. And so we look at those, those principles all throughout the, not just the sales channel, but also through um, the life cycle of the products within every specific end user that relies on us. So StorageCraft and ESET, um, in, as uh, Amelia mentioned, our products are now available through, uh, through the ESET sales channel. Um, there are lots of opportunities for you to be able to see them and get live demos um, through your ESET sales reps, and we're excited to be a part of this. We've, we've always believed that security and disaster recovery are really solutions that, that uh, are hand in hand, that people need to have the two critical elements of your business and two things that you ab absolutely must address. So we feel like this is a partnership that just makes sense and we're excited to be a part of it. So Amelia has a, a polling question. I'll, I'll throw this back over to her for a second. Great, thanks Mike. Just to get a sense of you know who we've got on the line here this morning, just a quick polling question for you guys. What is your company type? Very simply, uh, are you an end user, a reseller, an MSP managed service provider, distributor, or something other than those uh, categories? So if you could just go ahead and respond. We'll give you guys a couple, couple seconds here to respond. Um, looks like you guys are, results are coming in. Just trying to get a sense of who we've got on the line. All right, so looking like we've got a decent mix here. Uh, about 35% of you are end users, 6% are resellers, 12% uh, are managed service providers, another 6% uh, are distributors, and then a lot of you fall into the other categories. So definitely thank you so much for, for voting on this. It's, it's definitely helpful for us to know who we've got on the line and kind of get you the, the right information that's going to be most beneficial to you. Um, so Mike, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. All right, thank you. And just for, for everyone's information, um, typically my presentations are geared towards um, resellers and managed service providers, um, but a lot of the information that we, that we share with them um, obviously applies to the end users who they're, who they're working with. So um, if I, if if there's something that I mentioned that sounds more like it's geared towards, um, you know, the reseller channel, feel free to ask a question, and I'm, I'm more than happy to clarify, you know, it from an end user perspective um, at the end if, if you feel like that's necessary. So let's talk a little bit about disasters. Um, why backup and disaster recovery are two different things, and really what what it means to to have a disaster uh, within your business. So a lot of times, you know, we define a disaster as some large, uh, large-scale um, environmental event, an earthquake, you know, something along those lines. But for us, um, a disaster is anything that disrupts normal business operations. Um, when you look at the, you know, the nature of how most businesses handle transactions today, having servers down, having employees unproductive, um, unable to communicate via email or, or phone systems. Um, that's very disruptive. That costs that costs the business money. It costs sales, and those sales are very difficult, uh, you know, to recover. And so, for us, that's how we define a disaster. It's anything that disrupts normal business operations. So here in Utah, a lot of times um, when we do disaster recovery planning, we talk about earthquakes a lot. We live right on a major fault line. Um, we, you know, we feel like that's probably the most likely natural disaster that that we would see here. Um, in other parts of the country, um, you would you would think about hurricanes or typhoons. Um, 
large-scale events that can can wipe out um, businesses across the the eastern seaboard or or the Gulf, you know, anywhere they happen to be. Um, and these are you know these are major events that put many companies out of business when they occur. Um, flooding is one that you know we have seen um, in our offices in Australia. We saw some pretty big floods over the past couple of years and have been able to help people recover um, in those those scenarios. And then you know in the the Midwest or other parts of the world, um, tornadoes and other other major events. So we think of all these different types of disasters and how they might affect our business. But the the truth is. Only about two to three percent of business interruption or of disasters are actually these natural disasters. So, when we think about planning for these large-scale events, it's also important to realize that you know 97, 98 percent of the time, the disaster that our business might encounter is not one of these. Um, these are, you know, these are disasters we obviously should prepare for, but we also need to make sure we're prepared for the more, much more common, um, much more common disasters. Um, some of those more common disasters. Would be, hang on, would be things like hardware failure, um, you know, where the the disk drive or the RAID system just it was at the end of its life cycle, or there was something that disrupted um, a, a power supply, something like that, where it's a local um, local hardware failure. But almost half of disasters are caused by hardware failure, and a lot of times those are you know caused with little to no warning. Another one is human error. Um, we just, StorageCraft recently moved into a new building, and as careful as we were in the move, um, one of our server racks uh, tipped over in the in the moving van, and it had a lot of our source code and some you know some very valuable things on it that would have been you know difficult for us to replace. Um, luckily, because uh, you know because it's what we do when we have a disaster recovery plan, um, that caused about five minutes of downtime for us, and we were back up and running. So, little things like that, um, where you think you've taken all the precautions, but you still have some human error that gets introduced. In our case, it was somebody just not tightening a strap the way it should have been tightened. Um, but you can have these have these errors and um, and cause some significant loss of business. Software error. Um, we are we are a software vendor, and as much as we would like to believe that software is perfect, um, we know that's just not the case. Um, you can have policies in place. You can have all kinds of protections in place to uh, prevent uh, malicious software or even just uh, inadequate software from being installed on your systems. But users tend to find a way to install their own uh, their own utilities and their own products um, on their systems within your environment and cause some of that uh, some of that error and again if you look at this 14% that's you know seven times more likely to happen to your business than a hurricane or an earthquake or some other type of disaster and then theft a lot of times when we think about theft we think of someone stealing a laptop or stealing um, is, you know stealing our information and what theft can actually also cause is loss of productivity so if someone steals an important employee's uh, laptop and you know you, you may have encryption and other things on it that prevent them from accessing the data. So the theft itself may not compromise your data, but that employee is now unproductive until their system is back up and running and um, they're able to to work again. And so having a disaster recovery plan in place needs to not only cover you know protection of the data on the system that was stolen, but also um, getting the the employee back up and running as quickly as possible. So for common disasters, and the reason I differentiate between common disasters and uncommon disasters is because there's really two types of recovery that you can look at in the disaster recovery plan. For an, an uncommon disaster, so the flood, the fire, the earthquake, you really need a cloud-based recovery. You need something that's off-site, that's located um, far away from wherever that disaster might have occurred, and you know that can have you up and running quickly from that remote location. However, all cloud solutions struggle with um, time to recover. They, they are slower than local backups. And sometimes when, or local recoveries, sometimes when we're um, planning for disasters and planning for these larger scale events, you know, we forget that in most occasions and in most occurrences, we're looking at a much faster recovery if we have a local backup as well and a local recovery option. So. Um, at StorageCraft, we like to help you prepare for both scenarios. Um, we believe you should be covered for both the common and the uncommon, but that local recovery will always be 
uh, the fastest recovery option for you. And so it's important that that doesn't get neglected in your disaster recovery planning and your disaster recovery strategy. Um, if right now your disaster recovery plan involves just having files copied off-site, um, you know, there, we'll go into some reasons why uh, that's definitely not an adequate, uh, adequate disaster recovery plan. So can you recover quickly? Um, that's really the scenario. Each of you should be able to calculate um, on your own what is the cost of, you know, an hour's downtime to your business. If you're unable to email, unable to take orders, um, unable to, to complete sales, you know, what is the cost of that hour of downtime? And how fast can you recover? Um, you know, and how fast do you need to be able to recover in order to, to stay in business? And that will be different for each of you, but um, faster is always going to be going to be better, and that's what we what we focus on here at StorageCraft. So with uncommon disasters, you need to have fast off-site recovery. You need a recovery option that doesn't require you to wait for your data to be shipped back to you um, via FedEx. You want um, a solution that doesn't require you to download terabytes of data before you're back up and running. Um, you want something that is fast and within minutes has you up and running um, from an off-site location. For common disasters, you want something that allows you to recover uh, quickly to any virtual or physical environment that you may have on hand. Um, if you've just had your, you know, a Dell server crash, you don't need to, you shouldn't have to wait for the replacement server to get in before you start your recovery. You should be able to recover it on whatever hardware you happen to have on hand um, or create a virtual environment and recover there. And at StorageCraft, we cover you in both of these scenarios. So another polling question. Um, I'll turn this back over to Amelia. Great. So just quickly to the audience, uh, do you have a disaster recovery plan in place? And it's very simple. Your options here are yes, yes, but it has not been tested, no, or maybe you're unsure. Um, and just note on this, uh, we cannot see who you are or how you're answering right now. This is just purely for the purpose of this webcast happening right now. Um, also a note to the folks that are maybe watching this in syndication, uh, polling is only open during the live presentation. So right now is your chance to, uh, to let us know. So please, please vote. And it looks like votes are coming in. But I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to respond here. All right, coming on in. So, so far it looks like more than half of you at 56% say, yes, you do have a disaster recovery plan in place. That's great. Um, not surprisingly, another... 25% uh, of you say, yes, you do, but it has not been tested. Um, and then there's a few of you out there, uh, about 16% that say, no, you do not have a disaster recovery plan in place. So thank you all for, uh, you know, participating in this, and thank you for your honesty. Um, Mike, I'll pass it back over to you. Okay, thanks. That's actually, um, that's really good information to know that, um, that you have uh, either a disaster recovery plan or one in place that uh, that needs to be tested. Um, so I hope that as as we talk, you can see how StorageCraft may be able to supplement your current disaster recovery plan or or improve upon it. Um, when we look out across the industry and um, look at data from from Gartner and and other analysts, um, about 65% of businesses, so this is anywhere from an SMB up to uh, Fortune 500, have no disaster recovery plan. Um, and 35% have the disaster recovery plan. So it sounds like you know, this audience is definitely um, uh, much more prepared than the, than the market in general out there. So that's, that's great news. Um, when we look at who has tested their plans, about 28% of those who have a plan have tested it. 72% um, have not tested it. And so when we look at um, you know, what is... Um, 28% of 35%, that's 9.8% um, of businesses out there, so less than 10%, have a fully tested disaster recovery plan. And by um, fully tested, what we refer to is, you know, have you done the recoveries in advance? Have you simulated 
um, you know, what would happen if your networks went down, brought your systems back up, and actually calculated how much time it takes you from the moment you're notified of the disaster to actually having employees back up and, and in productivity. Uh, the very best solutions are almost not noticeable um, if you implement them correctly, not even noticeable to the employees. Things just fail over and, and work. Um, in, in other cases, uh, you know, you could be down for days. And so the other th for those of you who have a backup and disaster recovery plan, I think one thing that would be great for you to take a look at is how long um, do you anticipate that employees would be unproductive um, during, the, uh, during whatever outage you have? And are there things that can be done to, to shorten that? So backup versus disaster recovery. Um, I, always, I always come back to this because I think a lot, of, a lot of companies, a lot of resellers, a lot of partners confuse backup and disaster recovery. So backup is a solution where um, you want to get your files and folders in an alternate location. You want to be able to get back to them sometime, um, but time is not um, of the essence. You need, for example, I would say, you know, pictures of my family would fall into this category. I really value them. Um, I want them back if there's ever a disaster. But if I have to wait a week to get them back, um, that's okay. You know, that's not going to, to harm anything if I have to wait um, for a period of time to get them back. Um, things that I would say are not okay, so for example, if I'm running a business and I've got my financial data um, that's necessary to run the business, if all I have is a copy of that financial data sitting somewhere else and I need to recover it, um, I need to, first of all, create a system, install all the applications, find all the license files, do all of those types of things, and then recover the file. So I'm actually, even though I can get the file back, uh, I can't actually access it or use it um, for a period of time. Um, in order to get back and up and running. Email is another critical application. You know, if I have to rebuild my Exchange server, it doesn't do me, a, well, it does me good to have a backup of my Exchange files and databases, but if I can't get them back up and running quickly without, you know, a day of reconfiguration and reinstallation, then I don't truly have a disaster recovery plan for that. So when we look at disaster recovery, we talk about recovery of the full systems, whether they're desktops or servers, being able to recover any file or folder, um, not just the ones that are sitting in, uh, you know, the, the locations designated by IT for backup. And then being able to recover the entire system to either another physical system, um, virtual systems, or, um, or cloud. So when we look at backup versus disaster recovery, um, I'll explain this chart here a little bit, but with disaster recovery, there's several different advantages. Typically, a disaster recovery option includes an image-based backup, uh, which takes a copy of every sector on that system. Uh, it allows for faster, more frequent backups than file-based backup does. It allows for complete system recovery. It gives you much less downtime, um, lower storage consumption over time, and more recovery points. The other thing that's critical is you can recover every file. So most companies have a policy that say you need to store your, um, you need to store your files in a specific location, and that location will be backed up. The people who are notorious for violating that policy are typically the CEOs, the CIOs, the um, people who, who feel like you know, their information is very important, and typically the people who can also fire the IT people um, are the ones violating the policy. So no one wants to have that uncomfortable conversation with the CEO that says, you know, hey, you didn't put your file in the right place, so I didn't back it up and I can't get it back. Um, how much better would it be if you could say, all right, even though we had the policy, I took care of you, I've got your file, and I can get it back. In fact, I can get your entire system back up and running um, if necessary. So when you look at this chart on the right, um, a common misconception with disaster recovery is that it takes up more disk space than file-based backup. The reason for that is that file-based backup um, only backs up the files you want where disaster recovery backs them all up. So it only, only goes to, to reason that, um, that you would use more space with a disaster recovery option. What we find, though, is so with this red line, you'll see that um, initially that's true. The disaster recovery takes up many times more, much, much greater disk space than the file-based backup would take. Um, but then we start this process where every 15 minutes we are backing up um, just the incremental sectors that change on the hard drive. So the backups that are happening every 15 minutes are very, very small. Where with a file-based backup, you continue to back up complete files. Um, 
you know, even if you're only doing those daily, it's getting full copies of those files throughout that, that time period. After um, about a three to four week period is what we find on average, we are actually using less space with our disaster recovery solutions than most file-based backups take. And we have a copy of every file every 15 minutes, and the file-based backup only has a copy of um, the files you select and maybe even only on a daily basis. So there are a lot of advantages to disaster recovery, including um, lower storage consumption, which is one that's not intuitive but, uh, but is very true. So the StorageCraft solution, um, how does StorageCraft meet these needs? Uh, we believe that a complete backup and disaster recovery solution needs to encompass the ability to backup the solution, manage those backups, and by manage we mean um, understand how often they're being taken, how long they're stored, what your retention policy is, all those types of things. Um, replicate the backup solutions, the, the backups so that you have a local copy and an offsite copy and then test that, not just your backup disaster recovery plan, but test the integrity of your backup chain um, over time. We have applications that allow you to that just run in the background and constantly monitor and check to see, you know, has part of the chain been accidentally deleted? If it has, ha let's recreate it for you without even having to, um, to manually uh, intervene in the process. But these four steps, the backup, manage, replicate, and test, are all part of the storage craft recoverability solution, and they're encompassed in the, the Shadow Protect um, backup solution as well as um, our Shadow Protect line of products and, and product suite. So when we look at disaster recovery, um, the most important thing, and this is obvious, but I think it's often neglected, um, a disaster recovery solution must focus on recovery and it must work. Um, it's, there's really no room for error here. If, if you're paying money for a solution and your, your systems go down, um, you need to be able to rely, rely on that to get it back up and, and running. Um, our best sales tactic here at StorageCraft, um, you know, we are not, um, it's, it's not very sophisticated. It's basically get people to try the product and typically they will buy it. Um, and when we say try it, we want them to actually try it and do a test recovery to see um, you know, how quickly their system comes back up and how quickly it's running. And it's typically um, not difficult uh, for our sales team to, you know, to help customers um, see that value if they're willing to try the product. So the backups have to be accurate. Um, there's no room for corruption or any inaccuracies in the backup at all. StorageCraft is taking a backup at the sector level. So every sector of your hard drive um, is copied and um, incremental sector changes are tracked on a you know moment to moment basis and then backed up as often as every 15 minutes or as infrequently as monthly. It all depends on, on what your needs are there. Um, the testing, like I said, falls into two categories, validating the integrity of the backup and also simulating the data access and recovery so that you can actually practice and see what happens. Just like you would have a fire drill with your company, um, your IT team should be having a recovery drill on a regular basis to see, you know, what have we done? Have we improved our recovery times over last month when we did this? But constantly evaluating, constantly looking at, you know, what can we do to, to improve our recovery? And then when it comes to recovery, it has to be fast and it has to be flexible because you honestly don't know um, what hardware you'll have available to you, um, what your internet connection will be like, what um, you know, you don't know what will be damaged, and so you need to prepare for scenarios where you're recovering to whatever is on hand. Anything from, you know, an alternate physical server. Uh, we've had companies recover their, um, their server to a laptop on a temporary basis and at least be able to run that way, where um, a number of others recover in the StorageCraft cloud and uh, let our servers do the work while they do the repairs back on their, their physical machines back in there in their location. So you need to have a very fast um, and flexible solution. So the products, um, and you'll, you'll work with your ESAT reps on understanding better which products specifically fit your needs. Um, I'll go into this in, in more detail. But on the backup side, our primary product is called Shadow Protect. Um, that's av available for Windows, um, for Linux, and um, and for both servers and desktops. It does uh, the back, it's the agent that sits on the machine and does the backup. So one thing that's unique about StorageCraft is the way our product is architected is we try to have as low impact on the system being backed up as possible. So for example, your Exchange server um, should have one function only and that's to 
uh, to serve up email and to um, to manage that. Backup should not be its primary responsibility. So although it's being backed up, we want to have very little impact. We want a fully loaded Exchange server to be able to back up every 15 minutes without even, um, you know, without missing a beat. So the product is designed to be very light and very low impact on that server. That means there are other functions, things like validating the backup chain, things like um, replication, that shouldn't have to be done by that Exchange server. And so we break out those other pieces into different solutions. For example, our image manager solution that can then sit on the server that is holding the backups. So imagine in your network you've got your Exchange server. It's backing up to a file server. That file server really has a lot of available processing power, uh, much more available processing power probably than your Exchange server because it's just not being used. Um, on that server. So that server can sit there and run the processes of validation, replication, um, you know, all of those pieces that um, you don't want your Exchange server doing. Um, several of our competitors will put that functionality on the, you know, on the server being backed up, and that's why, you know, the backup is notorious for um, a performance hit on the system that's being backed up, and you just, you just won't see that with StorageCraft. To give you an example, our Exchange server here has been running an imp incremental image chain for about eight years um, and backing up every 15 minutes. And it's validated, it's tested, um, test recoveries are done all the time, and our Exchange server you know, never, it never slows down, never, um, never has issues. In fact, we've even used our product to migrate it to, to new hardware during that time and still ma manage to maintain that chain of chain of backups over that time. So breaking up the technology and breaking up the solutions into these different pieces might seem like a small thing, but when it comes to implementation um, with your IT teams, they will, you know, they'll appreciate the fact that you can have the systems do the work that actually have the cycles uh, available to do that work. So more points of recovery. Um, those of you who have been involved with backup and disaster recovery for a long time probably remember the days when your backups had to happen at night, you had to have a window where um, people just knew they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to access data and, you know, the backup would be occurring. Um, one of the problems with that is a lot of times as data grew, the backups would take so long, the windows would get bigger, and pretty soon you ended up overlapping and backups wouldn't complete uh, because the systems had to be brought back up online and backups started to get neglected again. With solutions like um, Shadow Protect, you can back up as often as every 15 minutes. It's an, an entire, even though just change sectors are being backed up, um, from that point in time you can access every file and folder and even the complete system if necessary. Um, and those can happen as often as every 15 minutes. They can happen during your production day. Um, there's really, when we talk about speed of recovery, if I can recover in five minutes but what I get back is my data from a week ago, um, I really it's the same as having a week of downtime because I've lost that productivity. But if I can recover in five minutes and I get back to where I was 15 minutes ago, uh, it's only 20 minutes of loss, which is um, much more desirable. So the recovery should also be simple. Um, you'll never know the true value of your, your backup and recovery until you've had, to, you've had to do a recovery. With StorageCraft, all you do is select the point in time and decide Am I recovering files from that point in time, or am I recovering an entire system? Um, you choose a destination, and then you can either copy the files down to that destination, or you can, you can even do something as simple as right-clicking on the backup and saying, you know, virtual boot. And it will, even without doing a restoration, it will boot your backup, and you'll be able to have the whole system up and running. That's very, very important for... Um, for data that requires a very specific application in order to in order to access it, um, you know your your engineers um, are you know they're, a CAD file is going to have no use to them without the you know the application that they use to draw and edit and and create those files. Um, same thing with financial data. If you don't have your QuickBooks or your Navision um, up and running, then those files and databases really don't do you a lot of good. So. The recovery needs to be simple, whether you're recovering an entire uh, system or just recovering individual files. And then, can I recover? How flexible is it? Um, with StorageCraft, let's say that, uh, that I've been backing up a Dell server, but in the meantime, I've been migrating a lot of my systems to virtual systems. So I want to recover to an ESX server. Um, with us, that's, that's fast and simple um, to recover from a, a physical 
machine to a virtual machine. The more difficult task for a lot of companies is to go from one physical machine to another physical machine because the destination isn't as, as defined as it is in a, um, in a virtual environment. But with StorageCraft, we actually built that technology first. And so we tackled the more difficult problem first, which made our, our virtual, our physical to virtual much easier. And we can recover from any hard, a backup that was created on any hardware to um, any additional hardware or any new hardware that you might have. Also, so this is an illustration of what a local backup would look like. So you install the Shadow Protect um, on the local servers, um, whether they're physical or virtual, um, whatever they might be, and you store them on a local file server or, you know, a backup appliance. Um, sometimes they refer to those appliances as a BDR. Those appliances then can be replicated um, to the cloud. And we understand that a lot of businesses have their own cloud. They have their own off-site data center. And so we will um, facilitate through our replication technology any destination that, that you input. So we use either Intelligent FTP or a technology called ShadowStream to copy those backups off-site, either to your data center or to ours. Um, if you choose ours, there's some additional options where uh, you can then log into the web console and actually recover images and boot them directly in our cloud. So in the event of a failure, um, you're back up and running um, virtually in our cloud. You can rebuild your entire network, um, send the, you know, reconfigure the IP addresses so that uh, it looks like your local network and, and continue operating while you figure out how to recover from other effects of whatever that disaster was. If you put them in your own data center or your own cloud, um, you would have access to them the same way you would um, a local backup, but you would not be able to um, to do the quick recovery function from, from your own data center or your own cloud. So um, that's just a couple things to consider when determining wh which uh, cloud location you'd want to put your offsite backups into. Okay, virtual boot is a term you'll hear a lot when um, when you're dealing with storage craft, but what we found is that even even with the fastest backup and recovery products, there's always the issue of bandwidth. That um, you know, data always seems to be growing faster than bandwidth can support. So, um, we, we first we we first realized the need for this um, several years ago, about five years ago, when um, we lost one of our file servers. And we had a current backup of it that was you know only 15 minutes old, um, and we could um, we could get to the files inside of it and use them, but we couldn't get the server back up and running any faster than you could transfer you know several terabytes over the wire to the new the new server. And even with at the time we were the fastest recovery option, but it still took us about a day to transfer all of that data. Um, what we wanted, what we realized is that the backup. There's no reason that we couldn't just create some utilities that allowed you to boot the backup and within five minutes have that server up and running um, as a virtual machine um, in a temporary state where you could access the files, you could access the system, um, do everything you need to do while we're doing the recovery to a different physical device in the background. So this will be used a lot in, in conjunction with another technology we have called Head, Head Start Restore that allows you to do the, rec the physical recovery while you're running in the virtual system. And then at the very end, all you have to do is apply the last couple of incrementals, which will take just a couple minutes, um, shut one system down and bring the other system back up. And you end up recovering from the disaster um, in the amount of time as it would typically take you to do a reboot on the front end and a reboot on the back end. So um, very uh, this, this combination of solutions is very efficient in terms of minimizing the, the overall amount of time that you end up um, down in, in a recovery mode. So for some of you, for those of you who are MSPs or resellers, um, you'll be interested in the different licensing options. Um, if you're an end user, um, these, these are interesting to you as well, but um, I'll try and explain how they apply in both scenarios. So if you're a, a VAR, someone who typically just resells software, um, we do offer perpetual licenses that are typically, you know, the typical licenses within the software industry where you buy the license and then, um, and then there's a 20% maintenance every year if you want to continue with, with upgrades and updates. The, um, for the end user customers under that scenario, you actually own the license in that case. Um, the reseller doesn't own the license, they've resold it to you and they, um, 
and you are now the you know the owner of that license. You're able to move that license within the same end user customer. You can deactivate it and reactivate it on another machine as, as you retire machines, but it will act and behave just like a perpetual software license um, of almost any other product. For those of you who are managed service providers or for those of you who are end user customers who outsource your IT to a managed service provider, um, we do offer subscription-based licensing as well, which means the license is actually owned by the managed service provider. Um, they'll typically bundle it into their overall solution that they're providing to your company and then charge you based on you know, their monthly fee for their services. But uh, the license in that case is owned by the MSP. Um, if they lose you as a customer, they can move that license from your site to uh, a different site because they're the owner of that license. So those are the key differences. I think the main message that's important to understand today um, is that, you know, as, as an ESAP partner um, and end user customer, both are available to you uh, and you have the ability to choose which model makes the most sense for, um, for you either as a reseller or as an end user customer. Um, this is just a little bit more um, detail. I think the one thing I didn't explain on the last slide is the licensing is per machine um, per month on the subscription-based licensing. Uh, you pay only for what you're, what's in use. So if you lose a client or, um, or you know, they retire a server and don't replace it, um, your bill can actually go down from one month to the next. We don't require you to to commit to a large number of licenses. Your price per unit will go down with us the more that you have deployed, but each month you pay only for what you use that's out there. So I believe um, that brings us close to the end of the, of the I believe it does bring us to the end of the information that I have. So um, Amelia's got one more polling question and then we can open it up um, for Q&A. And so while she's going through the polling question, um, I'll start to take a look at your questions, so we're ready to go with those. Great. Thank you, Mike. I know there was just a lot of really great information in this presentation. So just as a reminder to the audience, please enter your questions uh, in the Bright Talk screen for the Q&A session. We're going to jump into that in just a second, but before we do, uh, we do have one last polling question for the audience. So please feel free to request one of the following, um, and your options here, a business edition trial of storage craft products a business edition trial of ESET software, which includes our remote administrator tool, um, product information or a demo, uh, information on becoming a reseller partner or managed service provider, or maybe none of the above. Um, polling will be open during the remainder of the webcast, so feel free to answer at any point. Um, also, just a reminder, check out the attachments tab for more information on the products that we discussed here today. And then for those of you folks going to the RSA conference in San Francisco this week or to Interop next week in Las Vegas, please do stop by our booth. We will be demoing the full um, storage craft solution there. So with that, I think we've got a few questions coming in from the audience. So Mike, if you're ready, we'll kind of start the first question here. Okay. Um, so the first question um, is, what is the best way to get a trial um, or purchase storage craft? The, the recommendation I would make there is um, on our polling question, you can request one there, um, you know, put down that you would like to, to receive one. Um, but there are several ways um, to, to get the demo so it, or to get the trial. One would be to, and probably the best, is to contact your ESET rep, um, whoever you typically deal with at ESET, um, for your purchases if you're an end user contact your ESET reseller and uh, we will quickly get uh, get everything set up um, for you to be able to trial and, and evaluate the product. So what operating systems are supported by Storage Path? We support um, all Windows platforms, so um, anything from the desktop to the server platforms from you know foundation server all the way up to uh, Exchange and SQL servers. Um, we even offer granular recovery on Exchange servers. Um, so basically any Windows environment is a, is a safe bet. Um, the, um, that's the, um, that's the Windows operating systems. On the Linux side, we have, um, the, the, on Linux, it's, uh, CentOS, it's, uh, SUSE, it's Red Hat, um, the main, main distributions of Linux, uh, the primary ones are supported. Um, you can check with um, the StorageCraft website for a specific list, 
it's constantly updating. Really, the only um, it, we update that list as we test on new new environments that are requested. So, if you have a specific flavor of Linux that you don't see on the storage craft list, um, you can contact. Um, there, there's a place there where you can request um, like feature updates and those types of things, and uh, and we can add that to the list to be tested. But really, that's the only, with most Linux, it, it seems to be a pretty simple process for us to go through and, and add it to the list, but we do need to make sure it's fully tested on our end before we add it to that list. Um, let's see. What can I expect my estimated recovery time to be in any given disaster? Um, so typically, if you do a virtual boot, it takes about three minutes on the front end to where all it's doing is, rec is configuring the system to boot in a virtual environment. Um, that's, that's time that is not part of just the boot. That's actual work that the product has to do. Um, and then the, the boot actually happens where, um, where then it takes basically as long as it would take you to boot up a, a VM in any other environment. So um, I would say from start to finish, when you start the virtual boot to having it up and running, um, depending on, you know, how complex that system is, um, I would say anywhere from, you know, five minutes to ten minutes where um, you have the system back up and running. After it's back up and running, there usually will be a little bit of work um, you need to do. It's usually not critical, but um, things like video drivers and a few of those things um, may need to update themselves, and that's something that, uh, you know, you can kind of do while the system's up and running and, and while you're actually in, in production. Um, so can you talk in more detail about the maintenance fee? So the, with, with, if you buy perpetual licenses um, and you purchase a license of Shadow Protect for use on your server, um, each year, so the first year of maintenance is included, so you don't pay any additional to get that maintenance during the first year. What that includes is um, all updates and upgrades, whether they're you know, minor updates to major product upgrades, um, you will get those for free during your maintenance period. Um, it also entitles you to, um, to additional product support beyond, you know, web and, and forum-based support um, during that time. Each year, if you'd like to renew maintenance, um, it's a 20% annual fee, and the, it's basically 20% of the then current cost of the product. Uh, you pay that, and then you can continue for, um, you know, with upgrades and updates. If you're out of maintenance, then you would be required to purchase upgrades um, at, I believe they're a half price typically uh, when you buy those upgrades. And upgrade pricing applies to anything um, one version back of the product. So if you've been out of maintenance long enough that you're now two versions back on the product, then you need to, you need to buy a, a new license at that point. So we typically recommend maintenance uh, because it does add a lot of value. Um, it keeps you, um, you know, in the most current version of the product you know, with all the updates and upgrades as often as, often as you need them. Um, and then ESET, the other question, ESET will not offer its partners the cloud option for now. Is that correct? Um, that's one that we will need to probably get back to you on specifically. Um, the status of that part of the agreement is something I'm not uh, – I'm not as aware of at this point. I know it's the it's the goal to have the entire solution available to ESET partners, and, and we're working towards that. But I'll need to check and see exactly where we are um, on on that part of the that part of the agreement. So um, I guess on that we can, since we know who all the participants are, we could send out um, a response on that specific question once I'm able to to get the details. Great. Well, it looks like that concludes our Q&A session. Um, so, Mike, thank you so much for, for presenting today and for being here. Um, oh, wait, Mike, if you're still there, we have one last question that just came in. Um, how often do you, do you do product updates, upgrades? So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and it's an answer that I'm, our engineering team would probably um, shoot me if they thought I was going to answer it, but I am going to answer it. <laughs> we, there's two answers. So one, with our cloud-based products, um, updates happen behind the scenes um, almost monthly, where we're pushing out updates uh, to the cloud, um, you know, constantly building in additional security and, and other things to, to make that solution more robust. On the um, 
the installed versions of the product, typically I would say we have a major release um, every 24 months on those. Um, where, if, for example, we just had our major release of our Linux product um, in March. Our update of our Linux product will happen in May, or of our Windows product will happen in May. And then normally about every four to five months we have um, minor updates on that, you know, bug fixes, um, the, just performance improvements, those types of things with major feature upgrades happening um, in like an 18 to 24 month time frame. We're trying to get to more of a model where, um, because most of our business now is on a subscription basis, we want to get to a model where um, we look more like um, a SaaS offering software as a service in terms of our updates where, um, you know, those updates are pushed out more frequently and, um, you know, we, we continually add things without being locked into, you know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 type of uh, type of release cycle. So. Um, you know, we'll always be open about that, and and you'll you'll know what to expect. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thanks for answering that question. I certainly won't throw you under the bus with your engineering team. Um, so thank you, Mike, and thank you all for participating in today's webcast. Um, we sincerely hope you found it valuable. You can rate this webcast or share it through your social media channels in your Bright Talk window. For more information on ESET endpoint security products or on StorageCraft products, please go to ESET, ESET.com. Thank you, and that concludes our webcast.